Hello, we're taking a break today from the masterclass to have a special episode on having a Christ-centered Easter. But before we begin, I did want to remind you that we'll be having an online masterclass discussion on Tuesday, March 26th at 10 a.m. Mountain Daylight Time. It'll be held on Instagram. You're welcome to join live. My handle is at John Hilton III. Again, hope to see you on Tuesday, March 26th at 10 a.m. Mountain Daylight Time. Hi, I'm John Hilton, and I'm so excited to be here with my wife, Lonnie. We're talking about celebrating the Easter season in a Christ-centered way. And if there was a thesis for the time we have together, it comes from a talk given by Elder Gary E. Stevenson. He said, I observe a growing effort among Latter-day Saints toward a more Christ-centered Easter. This includes a greater and more thoughtful recognition of Palm Sunday and Good Friday as practiced by some of our Christian cousins. We might also adopt appropriate Christ-centered Easter traditions found in the cultures and practices of countries worldwide. Elder Stevenson then quoted New Testament scholar N.T. Wright, who said, We should be taking steps to celebrate Easter in creative new ways, in art, literature, children's games, poetry, music, dance, festivals, bells, special concerts. This is our greatest festival. Take Christmas away, and in biblical terms, you lose two chapters at the front of Matthew and Luke, nothing else. Take Easter away, and you don't have a New Testament. You don't have a Christianity. So as we've been thinking about this quote, we've been talking about wanting to do a a special little episode here where we can talk about different ways to focus on Christ during the Easter season. And today we'll talk about the season in general, thinking about Easter not just as a day, but a season. And we'll share a few specific ideas of how to celebrate Palm Sunday, the Last Supper, Good Friday, Easter, and then extending the Easter season. Before we begin, though, I just want to say there's tons that we could share. This could be an hour and hours and hours of video. But if you are interested in going into more depth on anything that we talk about, at the website lonniehilton.com slash Easter, that's L-A-N-I, hilton.com slash Easter, we've linked to lots of resources that you can use. So, Lonnie, why don't you tell us a little bit first about the idea of celebrating Easter as a season, not just a day? So... That's what's so fun is that there's so much time. You can think about the weeks before Easter. You can think about just Holy Week. You can think about the specific days. And you can think about after Easter, the holy events that happen after. Like there's so much scripturally rich things that we can pull from the scriptures. There's so many great things from the scriptures that happen during this time. And if we can have in that mindset, it's a whole Easter season. And just like for Christmas, we'd prepare weeks in advance. We'd put up the decorations weeks in advance, and we'd be doing activities to anticipate Christmas Day. So it's a whole Christmas season, not just Christmas Day. Then some of these ideas that we share will will not maybe be so overwhelming. We won't think, oh, I have to do all that. One thing we can just be flexible and think of the whole Easter season to rejoice in Jesus Christ. So I really hope the Spirit will be here as we talk. And I hope that you will take some of these ideas and tweak them to work for your family. And I'm so grateful for people who've shared ideas with me and for ideas that have come, just things that I think will work because I like to be simple, but I also like to be in the scriptures and have the have what we're doing point us to the scriptures and point us to the Savior. So that's my hope. So as far as the whole Easter season, besides the decor that can be very religious in nature, you can think of golds and purples and green and anything Um, If there's spring things coming to life where you live, like bring them in. Those are great Easter decor. Palm branches are great Easter decor, Um, not just for Palm Sunday, but for the whole Easter season. And you can also think of music, wonderful Easter music, just like Christmas. We we love the Christmas music and just puts us in the spirit of Christmas, right? Easter music is the same beautiful religious music. Um, And we'll link to some of our favorites. So I think we should start with Palm Sunday, though. So so I'm talking about the weeks leading up to Holy Week, and Palm Sunday is what begins Holy Week. Palm Sunday marks the Savior's triumphal entry when he entered Jerusalem for the final time, and people from the city greeted him waving palm branches. They were treating him as their king, and they were hoping he would save them, and 
and how much they revered him from the stories they heard and the miracles they'd heard that he'd performed or they'd witnessed themselves. It was such a joyous day. And if you read in Luke 19, so each gospel will have its own account of Palm Sunday. I love Luke 19 because when the Pharisees um, see all the people praising Jesus, they say, Jesus, aren't you going to rebuke all these people? Can you hear how they're praising you? And Jesus says, if, if they didn't praise me, as in all these people didn't praise me, then even the rocks would cry out. The rocks would cry out. And that phrase confused me for a long time, but he's saying the rocks want to praise him. So you think of all creation. We have that beautiful hymn, All Creatures of Our God and King. And think of all creation singing praises to the Lord on Palm Sunday. And I love to sing praising music. We have praise you, the Lord, the Almighty. We have Hosanna songs. And in our family, we've acted out the event of Palm Sunday. We have one of our kids um, be the donkey. One of our kids ride on the donkey. We have the other kids. We don't have live greenery where we live now, but if you do, then go get some just greenery from around your house. Otherwise, you can order palm branches online for cheap and wave the palm branches and shout and read read the account and talk about how Jesus is the King of Kings. He is, he is who they were they were greeting him to be. He is their Savior, and and then sing a Palm Sunday hymn and sing a praising song. And that's that's what we do for Palm Sunday. It's simple, but I'll tell you, Palm Sunday for me recently has I've connected more because I have connected more with how important praising the Lord is. And important maybe is the wrong word. I guess how impactful praising the Lord is. So I remember a few months ago, I had a goal. I had talked to someone who had said when they went to church and they sang and they praised, um, it made such an impact on them and changing their life. And I thought, well, I feel like I worship. I feel like I teach the word of the Lord, but I don't know if I'm that good at praising. And so I had a goal to to praise in my prayers, to have them be praising prayers and praise the Lord before I went through maybe my regular things that I would pray for. Um, and it was so impactful. I feel like when I'm praising the Lord, especially for his goodness, his long suffering, his mercy, how quick he is to forgive, like that immediately I, I feel the Holy Ghost. And and I, I think I think we underestimate how powerful it is and how impactful it is for us to praise the Lord. So that's Palm Sunday. And real quick, sorry to interrupt, baby, but one thing that I wanted to share even before we went into Palm Sunday is the idea of there's lots of wonderful Easter traditions we have. Maybe we have Easter egg hunts, we have Easter baskets. And a piece of advice that my aunt and uncle who wrote a book called The Christ Centered Easter gave was to take some of the fun Easter traditions and just move them to a different time. So that between Palm Sunday and Easter, we can really focus on Holy Week. But if we if we maybe take the Easter egg hunt or the Easter baskets and we turn those into the spring bunny will come, that's something that we can do a week or two before Easter and then use Easter time to really focus on the Savior. Yeah, because otherwise I feel like children are be like, why can't we get candy and chocolate? So our kids still get their can their basket of chocolates and fun things. But we separate a little bit from these other things because there's so much other fun during Holy Week that is fun, but is more really centered on Jesus. So however you decide to do it, you don't have to throw them out. I don't think so. We haven't, and I'm glad we haven't. A couple of other things just before we keep going with Holy Week is we're talking mostly in the context of what we've done with our own family, but I hope that you don't feel like our family is perfect. Sometimes we'll describe things and you think, oh, wow, this sounds like it was so amazing. But if you had been in our family that day and seeing a child crying because he didn't get to be the donkey or all the different things that happened. It's not perfect. And also some of these are ideas that you could do in different settings. You could do with nieces and nephews or grandchildren or as a primary activity days activity. So maybe just be thinking creatively about how during the Easter season, you can take some of these ideas. Like, for example, I think the next thing that we want to talk about is the Last Supper. And maybe in a context where you're going to be to do the Last Supper on Thursday night with your family isn't going to work, but this might be an activity you could do with the youth of your ward or with the seminary class or in some other way. Yeah. And another challenge with Easter that you don't necessarily have with Christmas is that the date changes from year to year and you, the world doesn't always give you time off. I feel like at Christmas, sometimes we're more respectful of giving others their family time, but it, Often Easter and Holy Week falls during a regular school week or 
you know, rather regular work week and you have your regular things and, and just life itself can be so busy. So it's hard to just find the time to do this. But for us, just even a couple minutes, we're doing our regular scripture study anyway. We can incorporate it. But like you said, it's not always wonderful. And this pertains to the Last Supper. So for the Last Supper, we try to have a Mediterranean style meal. So lentil soup or dried apricots, pita bread, hummus, that kind of food is um, would be Mediterranean style food. And we actually sit on the ground and we lay the tablecloth on the ground and we sit we set the plates on the tablecloth and we sit on the ground and we do eat with utensils, even though maybe Jesus didn't eat with utensils. And then while we're eating the meal, we'll have a little, a couple devotionals that pertain to events of the Last Supper. Now, in three of the Gospels, the Last Supper was likely a Passover meal. So we'll have some Passover elements, like a Seder plate in the middle with this symbolic food. Um, but we try not to do like a whole Passover that you might do if you went to a Passover, a modern day Passover today, because we want to focus on the events of the Last Supper. So some, so we can do that a different week, the week before, the week after. But for the Last Supper, some of the devotionals that I like to focus on are this: that Jesus washes their feet and he tells us that he that is greatest among you will be your servant and how important it is for us to have our mindset on serving others and helping others. And this is one of his last teachings to his disciples. And then in John chapter 13 to 16, he teaches so Jesus teaches so many beautiful, powerful passages and short passages. So in the ideal world, I'd have a Bible for each of my children. I'd say, search, pick 13, 14, 15, 16, either of those chapters, open it up and find your favorite teaching of Jesus. Um, I've also just printed out my favorite on one paper to simplify things. And, and then we've just shared from the paper that I print out when I don't have a Bible for each child, but to have a little discussion on some of these teachings, like as I have loved you, love one another, that comes from this time and so many beautiful teachings. And um, another thing of the Last Supper is that Jesus instituted the first sacrament. So reading those verses where he says, he breaks the bread and he says, this do in remembrance of my body. And we like to sing a hymn. And like it says in the Gospels, they sing a hymn and then they walk to the Garden of Gethsemane, which wasn't far away. So again, we're just kind of sharing a few brief ideas and we don't want you to think that all of these work out amazingly perfect at our home. But for me, the Last Supper meal is such a special time. There's something about having it be different where we're sitting on the ground in the living room that makes it memorable. There's some other things that we do during the week where Lonnie will put up pictures that go with Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday, and we'll read scriptures each day. And I love all of that. But Thursday is so different because we're sitting down together. And that takes us to Good Friday. And if you don't mind, Lonnie, maybe I'll share a couple of thoughts on Good Friday and then and then pass it to you. When I was growing up, I honestly never really thought of Good Friday as a very special day. And I was surprised to learn that in many countries, Good Friday is a national holiday. In several states, in the United States, Good Friday is a state holiday. And I wish it were in the state where I live so that I could spend a little bit more time focusing on the events of Good Friday. So even though it's not a holiday yet, we're trying to make it a holiday in our house by taking Good Friday as a day to really focus on the event that Jesus Christ defined as his greatest act of love, his crucifixion. So there are lots of ways that we can celebrate Good Friday. Lonnie, maybe we'll give some more specifics, but for me, a couple of favorites are, I like to read all of the accounts of the crucifixion. So this is basically Matthew 27, Mark 15, Luke 23, and John 18 and 19. To really take some time to sit down, think, and reflect on the scriptural events of Good Friday. I also love to watch a movie about Jesus Christ on that day. I've also found it really beneficial uh, sometimes to go to the temple and do work for the dead and think about how Jesus Christ made that possible through what transpired on the cross on Good Friday. I think it's interesting to know that people have been celebrating Good Friday since the fourth century. So there's more than 1700 years of Good Friday history and this is something that we can embrace. Elder Stevenson specifically mentioned Good Friday celebrations. Uh, at least up to this point, our, we don't have a lot of church services 
uh, at least in our area, that are related to Good Friday from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So sometimes I found it to be beneficial to join in with another Christian community and worship with them on Good Friday. Also, this is definitely not the most spiritual thing, but it is fun, I think, to have special foods. And a traditional Good Friday food is hot cross buns. It's easy to Google a recipe for hot cross buns. And that's a special food that we've associated with Good Friday in our family. So Lonnie, I know I left out lots of things. What are what do you want to add? So I want to talk about things from um, a mom's a mother's perspective. I wanted to know how could I help my kids really connect with this day and um, it's confusing because it there we feel sad on Good Friday because of so many the painful process of crucifixion, the sad um, the sad events that happen. But I I as I've come to associate the death of Jesus Christ with His love for me, then I feel like it's so much easier to help others rejoice in that love, to feel that love. We want to feel the sadness, we want to feel the love, we also want to feel the victory that Jesus's death brought in conquering Satan. So I feel like there's three, I feel like there's three feelings that we need to sit with. And, and, um, at first I was like this, how do you like celebrate a sad day? But I've, as again, as I've thought you, well, we can sit with the sadness and we should, as we sit with the feeling of love and helping our children rec- like connect Jesus's death with his love for us. Um, but also feeling the victory. And Eliza R. Snow used the term, the triumph of the cross. And I love that thinking of the victory that came because of um, his death. So in that mindset, I've been thinking with teaching children and thinking about how at Christmas time we have candy canes and we have paper angels to remind us of the people of the Christmas story. There are so many items that can remind us of the events and people of Good Friday. So I'm going to show you a couple and maybe go into detail with my favorite. Um, But to start off, just people of the Christmas story, it would be um, Barabbas. So I'm going to try to grab my objects. So like handcuffs or chains, something to show that he was bound and he couldn't get loose till he was set free because Jesus was not set free. And um, again, it's fun for our kids to have handcuffs. You see, I haven't got them out because that causes such a distraction. But um, another one is just a pretty ribbon for Pilate's wife um, or something else pretty to represent her. And I have a fancy kind of royal material to represent Pilate. You could use a gold crown to represent Herod. And I have lots of different colors of material. I don't know if you... Um, just different colors and pretty material to represent the woman at the cross. There's eight identified women. And um, white linen for burial clothes. This is, these again, these are easy to order online. And most of these I just found around my house, like this little stuffed lamb when we talk about how Jesus is the Passover lamb. And then fancy, this is a fancy red material. The veil of the temple was likely red, blues, purples, your finest, your bright royal colors and fine material. And you can talk about how when Jesus was crucified, it was torn in two. And the doctrinal significance of that, of now the way to back to Heavenly Father is open because of his death. And I love this one, the toy sword, which we've had because anyways, it's plastic and fun, but to that you... um representing the centurion at the cross who um, bore testimony at Jesus's death when he saw all these signs and the darkness and the earthquake and the graves open and he sees Jesus on the cross and he says, surely this is the son of God. And I, obviously the children love this, um, but then we can pause and say, well, do we have a testimony of Jesus Christ? Have we seen signs? Have, have we, can we testify and have a short little testimony share? Um, and, also, and real quick on okay. this one, um, first of all, I'm sorry that I'm just like staring lovingly at Lonnie the whole time. I know that's a little awkward, but she's cute. Um, when we were talking about this a little bit before, I was like, I don't remember ever doing these items together as a family. And maybe you shared a couple of other venues where you can, yeah. you've done this before, not just with our kids, but how else could we do this idea? So when nieces and nephews are gathering together, I just have my 20 items in a bag. They're all my Good Friday items. And I say, okay, let's talk about Good Friday and pull them out and they all choose an item. And then we talk about who it connects with. 
Um, uh, for Jesus, you could have a crown of thorns. Um, I tried to make my own and it didn't really work, but these are good to find online and a purple robe. They put a purple robe on him, a nail, a beam, a heavy beam. Also a cross to represent Simon who carried the cross and Jesus who carried the cross. So I'm getting carried away. There's a lot of items and I, I have a list. If, if this is exciting to you and you think, oh, this is a good way to get into it, then just look up, look up the list and I have scripture references. And I think it's good to connect them with people. I mean, Roman soldiers, the whip. But but the great thing about this is it connects with people and makes us think about all these events and lessons we can learn from these people, and um, and and you you probably will connect with different people than me, but it's really made the narrative of Good Friday really come alive, and that I can sit with the story and think about the story and the elements more. Which has been really fun. One thing I want to highlight, I love the idea of like when you said when the nieces and nephews come over or you could do this with uh, an activity days, girls, mm -hmm. but you don't have to do what Lonnie's talking about on Good Friday. I mean, it would be it's great true. to do on Good Friday, but you could do this on the Wednesday of Holy Week or you could do this two weeks before and say Good Friday is coming up. Yep. So let's think about how we're going to celebrate this. Yes. And um, if you're in the phase of baking sugar cookies or bread in the shape of a heart. And we have a cross shape one. So I'll do heart shape and cross shape again. So we connect the love of the savior with his death and his atoning sacrifice for us. Then, you know, those are, if you don't want to do cookies and treats, then cut out little paper hearts and paper cross shape things or draw pictures of them. It can be whatever you want, but just those things that connect the love of Jesus Christ with his death are so fun. So we could talk a lot more about Good Friday. And again, at Lonnie Hilton, L-A-N-I Hilton.com slash Easter. She's linked to tons of resources if you want to go more in depth. But for now, maybe let's jump ahead to Easter Sunday. Uh, well, okay. Before we jump into Easter Sunday, I do want to say just real quick, I think it's wonderful to do a little something on Saturday, to think about the time between death and the resurrection. Jesus's death is the tragedy. His resurrection is the triumph. And in our lives, there's a space between tragedy and triumph. It's the middle period. That's the Saturday of our lives. And so often we live in the Saturday of our life when things seem a little difficult. And I think it, that's a great devotional message to share on the Saturday as we think about the Savior. But Lonnie, tell us a little bit about Easter Sunday. What are, I mean, obviously there's many great ways. What are a couple that you think are especially valuable? Well, you know, on Christmas, the way that you wake up or maybe your kids wake you up, but I felt like the way that I began the morning would make a big difference. So I wake up our children with the music playing, He is Risen, and it's a rendition of children singing it. Um, it's a rendition by Melanie Hoffman from their Stories of Jesus album. I love it. Um, I love the Tabernacle Choir's rendition of He is Risen as well. And when I go and I'm running to my kids' rooms to wake them up Easter morning, it's I feel like the women who were at the tomb and they came and the angel said, he's not here, he's risen. Go and tell. Go and tell the others. So I feel like I'm going and telling the others, my children, he's risen, come. And then we'll go and have a, a sunrise devotional and read um, the resurrection accounts that, that we often will read John 20 or Luke 24. Um it's not, it's not anything grandiose. We'll have simple resurrection rolls and then we'll have our, we have creamed eggs on toast as our breakfast, but I love beginning the day rejoicing in the resurrection. And then we can have our fun traditional foods and depending on when church is that day, we might, we might have to rush off to church um, or we can do some more activities. But I also just like to talk about the other, so many appearances, right? We often focus on Mary Magdalene, the other Mary who were at the tomb and saw Jesus um, but then remember he appeared to the Cleophas and his friends when they were walking, his friend, when they were walking on the road to Emmaus and he appeared to Peter. And then that evening he appeared to the disciples and, um, just talking about the scripture events. And as a part of our Sunday, Easter Sunday dinner, we'll have, um, honeycomb fish and honeycomb because that's what he ate when he appeared to his disciples. And he said, do you have any meat? And they ate that with him. And talking about how important it is to remember he is not just a spirit. He is a resurrected body of flesh and bones. And Jesus wanted them to know that. Um, other than that. 
I was going to say one thing that um, we I love to emphasize is that if you read in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, in each of these accounts, I don't know, like for me, when I was growing up, I guess I thought of the Easter messages, Jesus was resurrected, so I will be resurrected, and I can live with my family together again. And that is a true message of Easter. It's really important. But in all of the resurrection accounts, Jesus doesn't say anything about you will be resurrected. The message is Jesus has been resurrected. Now go tell everyone about it. It's so clear. And so I think on Easter Sunday, that's a great time for us to focus a little bit on sharing the gospel, sharing our own testimonies, and how can we spread the good news, which is what Jesus asked us to do on Easter Sunday. And we can also add in the accounts of 3rd Nephi. That was something that Elder Stevenson mentioned in his talk. And, and also in 3rd Nephi 11, the resurrection account among the Nephites, at the very end of 3rd Nephi 11, Jesus again says, go and tell everyone what I have shared with you. Preach my gospel. Wow, that was a great connection. And talking about also we on Good Friday, talking about the events that were occurring in the Americans. Like mm. it was dark for three days. There were three hours of storms and earthquakes and tempests. So you could, we sometimes turn off the lights during a meal and have darkness and remember those signs that were happening there. So again, on Easter Sunday, um, but if we're going to talk about going beyond Easter Sunday, now Easter, Easter is so glorious and you, we hope our home is filled with the Holy Ghost. We're, we're, we're listening to the beautiful music. We're testifying to the Savior. We're letting others testify to the Savior. And um, one Easter, it wasn't so great. I prob I wasn't doing all I could do. And I was so sad at the end of Easter Sunday because I just thought I had failed my family. And I realized as I turned to the scriptures that actually Jesus appeared the next week. And he appeared to Thomas. And, um, and so I realized, hey, next Sunday we can do Easter again. We failed today, but let's do Easter again the right way and, and be in the scriptures with Thomas. So we celebrate Thomas's day the week after and talk about um, the significance of that, that he was blessed because he saw Jesus, but more blessed are those who believe who haven't seen him. And that's so many of us who haven't seen Jesus, but believe. And then the reasons to continue to celebrate the resurrected Savior just continue. He continued to minister. He met them back at the Sea of Galilee. This is John chapter 21. And he instructed them to feed his sheep and feed his lambs. And he gave them the great commission to go into all the world and preach his gospel. That was in these 40 days of ministering. And then he comes back to Jerusalem and he ascends to heaven from the Mount of Olives 40 days later. So I have in my mind, seriously, months long, the Easter season is months before and after, because 40 days is more than a month after Easter. And then Pentecost comes 50 days after. And um, that's Acts chapter two. And if you're if you want ideas of how to commemorate those days, then you can look at the resources below. But it's so fun for me to have um, a, a easy way to like say it's this time we get to be intentional about talking about Jesus Christ. Just like at Christmas, it's easier maybe for some people to have an open heart and testify of Jesus Christ this whole Easter season is as well. We've enjoyed this time together talking with you a little bit about having a Christ-centered Easter season. We hope it's been helpful. We hope that it's not overwhelming. We are definitely not perfect at these things. And these are all kind of traditions and ideas that we've built over the last 15 to 20 years. So we definitely did not do all of this at once. Lonnie, before we wrap up, is there anything that we missed or you want to kind of jump back to any other ideas, thoughts you want to share? Yes. So years ago, when it was harder to find tombs and decor of that nature, my daughter Katrina made this clay tomb and she put a little bed inside and the stone that you roll away. So if there's, if you're like, ah, oh, I don't know where to get Easter, I don't have money for that. You can make them. And this has mm, stayed. That's like a fun craft activity. This is actually. a craft activity. And it reminds me of another fun activity to do during Holy Week. We didn't talk about this event, but that Jesus taught in parables. And so this is an idea we got from Joe and Janet Hill's book to make oil lamps out of clay. Mm. So you can do homemade clay or store-bought clay. And you make it a couple days ahead of time because it needs time to dry. Um, we'll often do this on the Wednesday of Holy Week. And we just put a little bit of oil in it and a little napkin to light it on fire. So our kids are at the age where it's not as fun to decorate eggs, but they still think this is fun and it's dangerous. So be careful. I make them stay in one spot, but it's so fun to make these and to act out the parable of the 10 virgins and read the 
account in the scriptures and love it. So, and if, uh, you'll get other ideas as you think about, he taught so many, par- Jesus taught so many parables during this week. Um, you can make him come alive. I, this is so fun. I'm still thinking of more ideas I want to start implementing. And it's so delightful. It really is delightful to be in the scriptures, the events of this week. Okay, so Holy Week makes up almost 40% of the Gospel of John. So we think, wow, a lot happened this week. And it really did. And a lot is in the scriptures. And go there and you'll get, search them and you'll get your own ideas of how to talk about these holy, sacred events. I want to talk about a little bit more about Book of Mormon Easter. So from the time that there were three days of darkness at, at the Savior's crucifixion, it's almost a year later that the resurrected Jesus appears in 3 Nephi 11. It's hard to know that because it's just the next chapter. But um, thinking about it in your mind, we can start talking about him, you know, the weeks after Easter. Um or on Easter Sunday, that's great. And just recently, I have a couple ideas of what we could do with our children. Um, so remember, he starts speaking to them, and it's three times that they hear his voice, and they it's not till the third time they understand it. And so my daughter had the idea, well, let's whisper something and see if they can get it by the third time. Another idea is in 35, 17, when the angels come down from heaven with the children, and it's just this sacred experience. And And they can't even write how wonderful and joyful it was because it was so sacred. Um, So giving our children scarves, something to just dance around and just feel the joy that was felt during this time of of this inner this heavenly interaction with, with the resurrected savior there and this the angels appearing um so whatever it is if it's dancing to church music as they're you know whatever will help you will help your children feel that joy and then i had the idea you know you can dance and freeze so you dance and then you freeze and look to heaven then you move you stop the music and dance and look to heaven so those are two ideas to implement the the book of mormon um, Easter story, which I love. And I just want to read this account from Third Nephi. Well, this verse from Third Nephi. The first thing he says when he comes down from heaven is he says, Behold, I am Jesus Christ, who the prophets testified shall come into the world. Behold, I am the light and the life of the world. I have drunk out of the bitter cup, which the Father hath given me. Now I'm going to skip down a couple of verses, like only two verses. And he then he says, Arise. And come forth unto me that you may thrust your hands into my side and also that you may fill the prints of the nails in my hands and my feet and know. This is what he wanted them to know. So that's intimate. So if I was teaching this to children, I'd say, fill your hands, fill your side. And he wanted them to know. This is what he wanted to know, that I am the God of Israel and the God of the whole earth and have been slain for the sins of the world. And maybe we'd repeat that verse a couple of times so they can memorize it a little bit or really get it into their heart so they can know why he wanted them to come forth. And I love when we talk about Easter, talking about so many witnesses of him. Jesus it wants us to know he is real. He wants us to know he was resurrected. All of these accounts, all of these witnesses, and now these 2,500 people in the Book of Mormon account, so many, and not even counting the modern day witnesses of Jesus. Um, like he doesn't want us to guess. And I just want to end with testifying that that is the case for us. He doesn't want us to wonder if he's real. He wants us to know he's real. And that's a prayer that will be answered if we pray to our father in heaven and want to know, is Jesus really the savior of the world? Did he really, was he really slain for the sins of the world? That's a prayer that heavenly father will answer. And I testify that he, he is the savior of the world and he was slain and we can feel such love and joy. Um, because of that. This has been a really fun uh, time for me. Thanks, Lonnie. I love being with you. And I hope that, I, I think we've, we've really focused maybe at some level on the applications, kind of like some specific practices and ideas. And I love, Lonnie, how you just emphasize the doctrine. And what we know is that Jesus Christ died for our sins and he was resurrected. He lives today. And I pray that throughout the Easter season, not just on Easter, but in the weeks leading up and the weeks after that we'll be able to focus to center our lives on Jesus Christ and find deep joy in him.